Hello everybody. I'm very happy to be here. Last time I was here, that was before the pandemic in 2019. A lot of changed uh, since then. And what I would like to talk about today, amongst other things, is, is more about how I approach certain tasks rather than going through a specific workflow or explaining something in, in uh, great detail. So that's who I am. Um, that's my day job. Currently, I'm working uh, for a company called GPFX, and I'm supervising a very interesting Disney Plus uh, series that we are currently shooting. So it's in, 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 uh, in the early phase of its incarnation, but hopefully it's going to be really, really exciting. Um, I mentioned that I mostly work in feature films, and Jonas mentioned that I mostly work in feature films. These days, uh, there's quite a lot of television or streaming um, films, streaming services work going on. But I do commercials, um, sometimes experimental stuff. This is some of the films that I worked on, and, and funnily enough, it started a couple of years ago, it started to be all sci-fi, which I was really excited about because I like that. But then in the last two, three years, more and more less sci-fi things started to happen. So uh, it's cool. It's transi transitioning into something else, which I'm really happy about. I also do quite a lot of, I try to do uh, a fair amount of interesting art-based projects. And one of that was uh, creating some imagery for a book called um, The Age of Data, where I used photographs from the Apollo missions and created these uh, wind cloud representations. And all those were based on photogrammetry, which I'm going to say a few words about. And um, in general, I like to experiment with this, uh, you know, any new technology. This is something which is based on real-time camera tracking. I, I wanted to see how can I create a user interface that has depth. So um, I, tr I try to do interesting things. This is my showreel. Yeah, so um, I think you know, that shows I'm kind of like um, an overview of what I do. Um, looking at it for the end time, I just recognize that, recognize that there's a bit too much Ryan Gosling going on, but you know, that's probably, uh, I don't know. I don't want to elaborate on that. So what I'm going to talk about today is going to be actually two things. One is um, going to be a small indie film. And I'm going to show you certain techniques that I used in that film. I'm going to talk about um, how I approach things when it comes to doing things them very quickly and, and, and cheap. And then I'm going to talk about The Matrix uh, Resurrections, which was a project that I worked on through the pandemic. Uh, started out in 2019, actually not uh, too much after I was last time at the IBC. But what connects both of these projects, big and small, is, uh, is Cinema 4D and some other Maxim products. It's not a cry for help. That's the title uh, of that short film I want to talk about. A few words before we get into the details. I got a phone call right around the beginning of the pandemic uh, about a guy who I never talked to. His name was Rupert Ratcliffe, and uh, he wanted me to 
give him a budget on how much would it cost to do high-end visual effects for a short indie film that he finances himself. And I did the numbers, and it turns out to be that it's going to be way beyond what he can manage. So we took a step back, and then I talked to him, and I said, you know what, Rupert, let's do it it's very, very work. cheap. I'm going to do the best. I'm going to have a few guys working for you and for me. But let's keep this economical. So the reason why money came up as an issue is he wanted to have holographic interfaces. He wanted to have... Um, sorry, I think it's not too to access the new software, um, you need to upgrade This AI assistant. assistant who turns out to be more than just that. And um, that was featured in, in, in a huge amount of shots. So we needed to figure out how to do that. And on top of Could that, because he asked me to kind of keep an eye on the film from a visual effects perspective, we needed to figure out how we're going to deal with tracking, Just do it. Um, lens distortion, all sorts of fun stuff that usually not too many people are considering. And, you know, when you talk about holograms, lens distortion, tracking, animation, whatever, immediately C4D comes to my mind because that does everything that I just described. And um, I think I, I was really, really surprised how well Cinema 4D could do tracking tasks, for example. What's really important is, and I think that's something that quite a lot of artists forget when they talk about tracking is, is to do lens grids and, and do uh, proper lens distortion, undistort the plates, and then you can do everything you want to do with them. That's pretty much the setting of, of how this project started. And then uh, I'm going to say a few words about how I designed this AI entity. So Rupert's idea was that it needs to be friendly. It needs to be technical, but it can't be um, a, an intimidating thing. So it needed to be... You know, it needed to be human almost. And it was voiced by Mark Strong, who's an incredible actor. And he's not featured in the film, but he does the voiceover. So essentially, I, we had to create a version of him uh, being present in almost every shot, doing uh, all the emotions that he can't do besides his voice. So, oh, that goes back to the lens, lens, dis, lens distortion. Uh, issue. I think, um, and I'm pretty sure that everyone knows how to do that, but I just wanted to quickly kind of give you a heads up. This is just a checkerboard. And if you're an indie filmmaker, I, I always uh, encourage to, sh to shoot this. Get your cameras, get your lenses, shoot the lens grid, and then you can build up a database that I keep in my 3D files. And whenever I need to make sure that the tracking works well, I just go back to that uh, database, bring out the relevant lens distortion file and and tracking is is basically not an issue anytime after that but we were talking about the design process of this um, ai entity sorry about that which was called water if i'm not mistaken so uh, this this is just a quick overview of how many variations we had and as you can see here all of them are based on some sort of particle simulation. Um, and the reason why I wanted to kind of show you this is, I think besides one or two of them, all of these is based on the same underlying animated surface. And that's the cheap, and that's the, that's the kind of how to do things uh, on a budget uh, type of version of this. Because obviously, if you have uh, a huge amount of money, you can do as much of these with different underlying animations. But what I wanted to do was to kind of give you an idea um, how I did that. Now, I had a slightly different idea about how I'm going to show you this, but I might, might do it as well. So bear with me for a sec. Let's open Cinema 4D. <laughs> Classic. So, 
you see what I'm saying now. Oh, awesome. So, um, let's go into this. And I'm gonna, probably that's the first, no, that's the first version. So you can see uh, how this scene was created. Uh, let me try to play that back. That was the first incarnation of of, uh, of Volta. And obviously in its current form, it's not too much, but it's probably interesting enough to kind of start the, the edit process with. So you render something like this out, you give it to the editor when they try to kind of assemble the shots and then um, fingers crossed it does the job. But what I'm gonna show you is how it, it's actually set up. It's uh, nothing too difficult. It's a disc, right? Let me turn this off. Where are you, Emita? Ah, interesting. So it's just a disc and it has an ocean deformer on it that kind of creates this undulating movement, right? And then I started to emit particles. Sorry, it's, it's really, really hot. Um, started to emit particles from it. And that was the basic version. Not, not too much to see here, but it's, it's probably good enough for a version. So as we iterated through the film, this setup started to become more and more um, complicated to a certain degree. So that's another incarnation of this. As you can see, uh, this time the ocean deformer, and I think, oh, I, can you hear me now? So this time the ocean deformer was mapped onto a sphere, which I'm going to show you how it looks. All right. So that undulating sphere creates the movements uh, that affect how the particles are em emitted. I set up a, uh, a redshift shader, shader to render these particles out and I applied an insane amount of motion blur. So it creates this kind of blurry image. Let's move on to the next version. Woo. Is it better? Is it working? Hello? Can you hear me now? Okay. Let's continue. So let's go to the next version. Sorry. I guess I wanted to show you this because that was the, the final incarnation. It's a little bit more complex as a particle simulation because it has a, a flip container around it. Um, and it also has some um, kind of shading going on based on vertex maps and whatnot. Uh, but again, the underlying idea is very, very similar to what you've seen before. And um, that's how we created that little element called water. Let me let me go back to the presentation very quickly. Moving forward with this, there was another request which was for a holographic table. Uh, and the idea was the character tries to turn it on with his hand gestures and it seems to be turning on but then it's not working. So I, I personally did a lot of this kind of uh, effect for feature mm -hmm. films and um, they were all based on the idea of we are doing an animation rendering out a lot of passes building that up in comp and then see what happens with that but because we do not have did not have time and resources to do that uh, we needed to do a slightly simpler approach uh, let me try to open that as well. So I, all I wanted to do is, is render out two passes. This is the setup. I just wanted to show you this. It's a 
it's a volume builder. I put this building into that. Um, and I believe it's based on animating the voxel size. So it's very straightforward. It has a, a cube that's um, subtracted from that structure. It's animated on the x-axis as it goes up. And it creates this, uh, I, you know, the idea was that it's, it's kind of rasterizing it or, you know, fine tuning the rendering whilst it turns on. So from going, going from a rougher version to a more precise version. Um, and as I said, originally that was meant to be a, a, a quite complex thing, but I decided not to do that, that complex. And I just rendered two passes at the end. Um, sorry. Um, okay. Clearly we are having some technical difficulties, but let's go back to the presentation. Okay. I'm not going to bother with that. So I wanted to render just two passes. Um, I rendered one with some sort of glass like shader. And then I rendered one with Sketch and Tune, which used to be the old recipe that I used throughout the years on, on, on various feature films. And in comp, these are kind of laid over one another and all sorts of uh, red giant stuff where it's used to create that glitching thing. If I'm not mistaken, there was um, Hollow Matrix that I used on this one. This is a red giant plugin. Uh, again, the idea was not to go somewhere else, just stick with After Effects and, and the Red Giant suite of plugins because that has everything that we need for the post-production of this film. We did everything in, um, did we do it in Aces? Maybe not, maybe at that time not. Um, but we could have done if we wanted to, right? Um, so essentially we delivered around 15, 20 shots in, a, in about two weeks, plus around one and a half weeks of design time. And obviously, because this was a very low budget film, this was spread out through uh, a couple of months. Um, but the results are, I think, fairly good. And uh, the film is doing its rounds uh, at short film festivals. And I just talked to Rupert a couple of weeks ago, and he said that it was received well in certain places so he's looking at doing a feature film version of it hopefully with a much bigger budget and we can do much more fun stuff with it um, but do I have to say that it's going to be Cinema 4D that we're going to use on that one I don't think so so definitely we're going to stick with cinema for the feature film version and I'm pretty sure it's going to be absolutely exciting so shall we move on to the next thing this is actually the breakdown of how this was set up, as you can see. So there's a blue glass-like shader and a sketch in tune pass. That's kind of having some orange tint to it. And that's it. And this is one of those things where if you kind of get into the details and try to hold it up and, and you know, just investigate every little aspect of it, you probably would say, yeah, you know what? This is not necessarily super high end. But in the context of a film like that, to be seen for about 14 frames on screen, maybe a little bit more than that, I think that's perfectly enough. The other thing that I did for that small film was a uh, title sequence. I do quite a lot of title sequences. Um, the recent one that I can talk about was uh, What If, which was a Marvel film. Uh, and I did work for Perception in New York. And we created this very interesting, uh, almost hand animated uh, title sequence for that show. And when I offered that to Rupert that I can do a title sequence on top of the, the VFX stuff, he was really happy. So what I did here, again, I just used images from the film, uh, emitted particles based on the colors, put a camera very close to it, and then, and then just rendered it. Um, and then put some very rough chromatic aberration on top uh, and did a couple of color variations and that was done. So shall we move on to this one? Do you want me to talk about the matrix? Everyone likes to talk about the matrix, right? 
Um, so as I mentioned, I started to work on it in um, 2019. I got a phone call from uh, Sam Jones, who's the computer graphics supervisor for Studio C. Studio C is a part of CompuHire, and CompuHire is a company that's doing playback in the United Kingdom for about 25, 30 years. They have a huge array of computer monitors and when this whole thing started to happen, they were the first ones to put it on set and they asked uh, certain people to create content for those that could be used on set. This is how territory started. This is how, you know, that there was blind uh, and similar companies were doing at the time. And then after a while, uh, Studio C started up, which is uh, CompuHire's kind of version of, of, of a screen graphics company. Um, so Sam called me up and told me that, you know, there's a possibility to work on the Matrix and I was really excited about that. So we had a chance to read the script and then we figured out that we need to do two big things. One is a sort of real world uh, element that plays out in, in Neo's company office, which is a games company. So we needed to create a lot of screens with assets, a lot of screens that kind of show the process of how a game is put together, and various other things uh, I'm going to talk about. And then the second part of the project was to create the screens and, and, and content for the matrix. So when they are not in the simulation, but in the real world. So that's a completely different graphic and design language. And both of, both of those were equally interesting. And I'm going to talk about both of those. So in this image, you can see that head down there that uh, Neo has in front of him. And that was always meant to be a little kind of inside joke. He's this hotshot computer graphics programmer, and he's testing new render engines, right? And the idea was to create something that shows how in the world of Matrix a uh, uh, high technology, high, uh, you know, a new technology of render engine could be used or what it does or how does it look like. Obviously, that's all nonsense because, you know, I'm not going to tell you how render engines work or render engines work. I just made something up that potentially looks like that. But I would like to emphasize that never ever for a split second take it seriously. So this is not, not a glimpse into any sort of rendering technology or whatnot. Um, but obviously, because Neo is this designer, the design needed to be based on Neo's head. Um, what you have to know about these sort of projects is it happens very early in the filmmaking process. We do not have assets necessarily. We do not have access to uh, higher res scans in a lot of cases. So. What you see here is essentially me going onto the internet, trying to find some images of Keanu Reeves and putting them through a photogrammetry software. And thank God, I found a couple of images that were taken at the same moment from uh, different cameras. So I was able to do this very rough, very dodgy reconstruction of his face. But that's good enough as a starting point. I just definitely wanted to show you this because this is how the whole project started. Um, and I think it's a really interesting insight into what you can use to start your design process with. Um, so when I have that scan, took it into cinema. And what I'm doing, usually in a case like this, I start to chop it up. I just, you know, cut off the face, cut off the ears top of the head, back of the head. Uh, and I'm, I'm trying to do all sorts of interesting and fun stuff with it. Um, try to project text, project uh, some textures on it. Try to reduce the polygon count so it has this very low poly look. Uh, create some interesting textures that I can map onto either properly or not properly. The, the only goal is to create a huge amount of stuff that I can render. So usually I tend to have about 20, 30, 40 different renders 
all of them are doing the same movement. All of them are kind of um, have have the same underlying structure, but all of them are rendered differently. And then I go into um, After Effects and then just start to layer them up. And I created these versions and, and I don't know, probably 20 more based on almost, almost you know, the same elements. And the reason I'm doing that, because I can do that in about uh, two, three hours in an afternoon. And I can send these 20 versions to the production and they can come back to me and say, yeah, you know what? We like version 18, crack on with that. Um, so it's incredibly important for me to be able to give that amount of variation uh, to the decision makers in, in basically no time. Let me show you, this is just one of the render passes. Um, I believe it wasn't even sketch and tune. It was some projected, or I just dissected the face like that and just rendered the edges. Um, nothing really super fancy here. And this one was the uh, version where I I tried to replicate how a render engine in Neo's world could look like. This is um, this is the front of the face in a volume uh, builder, in a volume mesher, and I mapped an animated texture onto it that runs through the uh, whole thing. And it creates this, I don't know what it is. It's, it's hopefully some <laughs> interesting stuff that could be used in the context of a render. Um, let me try to open this in cinema. I have it here. Uh, there you are. This is the one. So, oh, it's actually one of the things that I wanted to point out that uh, when you export something from ZBrush, it comes in as ZBrush uh, default, but default is not default. It's it's written very different, and that always just cracks me up. Anyway, so I took that mesh that you saw earlier, the photogrammetry mesh in the ZBrush. Uh, and exported this version, and this is how it's animated in Cinema 4D. Um, it's this volume builder, right? So let's go through this. Uh, this is the head, is that brush head, right? Then I have a cube, another cube, oh, that's in uh, the uh, volume builder volume mesher, some sort of, uh, I think that was, that was before the random walk SSS came in. So that was a, <laughs> that took a bit longer to render than I expected back then, but you know, it was all fun. And rendering something like subsurface scattering wasn't even really uh, something that you thought about in production a couple of years ago. So being able to render something at all is, is always a big step forward. So moving forward with the presentation. A few words about these game assets. Because I mentioned that um, we had to do quite a lot of these. Um, I think that was about 30, 35 of this. And all of them were meant to be going within a UI that Gordon's purse and, and uh, Jay Dingle and some other guys created. So they were never meant to be used in isolation, but we had to create variations of this. So um, I kind of try to base that on the Unreal Engine, whatever, mascot or, or basic figure, just to kind of have a gentle nudge that this is a games company. Uh, but that's not based on that. That was uh, textured in Substance Painter. And I rigged all these to take Mixamo animations. You see the car? Can you tell me what model is that? No, because that's not an existing model. It's, uh, it's an amalgamation of a few things that started out as a, I can't say the brand, <laughs> but the entire front section and the back, back section is different because you can't use a real car in a situation like this, in a situation like this. Uh, same with the tank, 
that's a made up tank. I just kind of, you know, I thought about how it could look in the world of Matrix. And the other stuff that you see here is uh, photogrammetry scans that I took throughout the years. I just walked out to the park, I saw this interesting bit, and I did a scan of it. And what I'm doing with this is I'm taking them from the scan software, I'm taking them into cinema just to see, okay, is this something on, something interesting? Um, and I used to take them into ZBrush for creating a, a, a decimated and retopologized, automatically retopologized version, and then took them back to the photogrammetry software and uh, created new textures, and then brought back to cinema. So this is the ZBrush part of it. Um, Obviously, uh, now you have the Z remesher in Cinema 4D, so that's one step uh, less for me if I have to do something like this nowadays. And then it's taken back into cinema. This is, this is the asset that actually made its way into the film. Obviously, it's not perfect. It's, you know, automatic retopo. There are some defects. There are some polygons here and there, but... It's going to be about this size on a screen somewhere back at the end of the room. So I'm fine with that. But I created a lot of this. So um, my kind of thing that I was doing throughout the years was I was always scanning. I was always doing photogrammetry captures, build up, building up a library that I can use in a situation like this. So that's cool. This is how it ended up. This is the retopologized render with a reprojected texture within Cinema 4D. Uh, added some lights and rendered it with redshift. Nothing really special, but when you have to do 40 of these in, in, in a week, that's quite a lot. A few words about the tunnel. Do you remember the first matrix? There was this tunnel where they had to go through and it showed the way through the matrix. Uh, there was a brief to create a new version of that. Um, and they wanted to kind of remind the audience about the original about wanting to create something new so um what i had to do i had to come up with a way how i can animate cameras that are looping without being too uh you know noticeable so that was a that was a fairly big challenge because when you do that you just put a spline into that uh sweep nerves you animate the camera, but you need it to feel that it goes up and down. There, there are some lovely expresso, uh, you know, wizardry that needed to be done to be able to do that kind of thing. Um, but these basically ended up, uh, the, the, these were the, ca look at that, how well it fits onto these screens. I just recognized it. I'm really proud of that. <laughs> that was not intentional, but I, I think that's, that's good. So, um, these are the three different versions of that tunnel that we presented. The one in the middle that's really close to the original. That's like, uh, I do not remember what we added to it, but probably there, was, there were more segments and whatnot. The one on the right, that was my favorite, is that um, that's a lovely glass shader. You can see through it and, and it's, it's somewhat blurry and it has all sorts of interesting textures projected onto it. Uh, I think it, it was really great, but they decided to go with the third one, which I'm going to show you. This is how it looked when an animated. Um, again, this is a result of rendering four or five different things and putting them together. Let me open this in cinema quickly and show you how it works. Uh, 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 maybe not. You know what? Move on. There are other things. I'll, I'll do that later. But generally, this is what uh, that was what was requested. The tricky thing with this specific thing was that, again, uh, we had to create about 16, 15 different versions of it, and there were always constant notes about timing. So we did a version, rendered it, there were displaced glass renders and whatnot, so it took a while. And then they came back to me and said that, you know what, just uh, we need the, the front section to be 50 frames faster. So. That was a bit of a logistical nightmare. 
one of the things that I always like to do is do this kind of uh, medical scans, uh, screens, whatever they are. Um, the idea behind this was that um, they discovered that Neo has some implants in him, in his brain, in his body. And we needed to create um, variations. So it, 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 it needed to be kind of distinguishable from one another whilst maintaining the same sort of visual language, which is not an easy task to do uh, when you have to do like 15 different versions. There, there's a limited amount of uh, ideas that, that can go into this. But let me show you how it looks in cinema. That's probably explains it a little bit more. Uh, yeah, let's go with this. I started to panic when I opened this and I saw nothing and it's like, oh, what's going on? Then I recognized I turned everything off. So it always starts with a, with a Keanu or a Neo. Sorry about that. That was, that's based on that head that I showed you at the beginning. And I sculpted this in ZBrush, uh, UV'd it, and it, uh, I created some textures in Substance Painter. But in this case, it's irrelevant because that's just uh, used as a, as a volume. So we're not that worried about it. And I have the various parts of the anatomy underlying. I think, I believe part of that comes from a stock model. Part of that is, is bespoke but all these different elements of the body are rendered with different shaders. And there's always a variation of that um, going in. So some, I play with the um, various glass shaders, the, uh, you know, IOR and, and how reflective and refractive it is. Um, and then this is, this is essentially what the whole thing was about. This is the, um, let me just get closer. So this is that medical implant, right? And uh, we needed to create this. And that was a, that was a nightmare in, in a sense because we only had 2D drawings. Someone, some concept artist um, just painted it loosely and that was sold to the production as, as this is what you're gonna see. And obviously there's always a bit of a, a guesswork when that comes to 3D. So yeah. There's a, quite a lot of effort that went into this one. Um, I think I talked to Jonas about it yesterday. The way I use, usually do these that kind of things, I very quickly polymodel an underlying structure and then take it into ZBrush and then just sculpt on top of it, which I believe I'm going to kind of illustrate with this. So this starts out as a low poly model, which goes into ZBrush and then Obviously, using everything that ZBrush can have, a ZBrush, sorry, um, I just sculpt on, on top of this. I, I love how you can kind of move points around so you can be a little bit more loose. Um, it's nothing specific. That just illustrates the idea. So I had to do all this, bring it back into cinema, and then render all that stuff that you saw there um, quite a few times. This is a combination of what you saw earlier, plus some um, MRI scans that I have um, on my laptop that I managed to kind of create some volumes uh, from, which is always an interesting little thing. Well, let's move on to the, to the thing that I enjoy the most, creating the most, is um, we were talking about that Neo is a games designer and he won the uh, Designer of the Year Award in 1999 in the film. And the idea was that there is a game which is called The Matrix in The Matrix. So we had to create a version of him from the first film that he designed. Again, they're based on the same head, uh, sculpted this, modeled it, rendered it, textured it, whatever. And we had to turn around halfway and create another version of him because the brief on the game changed. It was meant to be originally some sort of high-end game, but then I think everyone recognized that in 1999, uh, there, was, there was kind of, the technology was a little bit more limited, so we need to pare back the expectations on that one. 
Um, but neophytes are always an agent, right? So you needed to create an agent. And unfortunately, um, the original actor who played, what was his name? Agent? Agent Smith, you're right. Agent Smith in the uh, first film it wasn't available for this one. Uh, so the first version where he used him was not good. So we needed to create another agent, um, which looks like me. Uh, and it's not, 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 uh, <laughs> that's not an accident because I had a scan of my head, which I did. And I thought that, you know, I can get away with putting that into the game, putting some sunglasses on and then, you know, I was ready to fight Neo. So this is the first version of that game that we created. Uh, it was meant to be a games teaser, sorry, not the entire games. This this is meant to be running on monitors showing the, oh yeah, you know, this is the product that you that you wanted to see. So that was the first version. That was the, oh, that's a bit too much version. And then we had to create another version, which was a little bit more 1999, a little bit more pair back. Uh, but one thing didn't change. I still felt that I have a chance to kind of fight Neo in the Matrix, um, which is going really well, as you can tell. <laughs> but I thought I wanted to show you this scene because that's, um, that kind of demonstrates a workflow that I use in, in, in these kind of circumstances. So um, in case you wanted to see that lovely fella, it's me, hello. Um, so let's take a look at this, right? This is one of the scenes from that little sequence that you saw. This is when, this is that bullet time moment when we freeze me there, the camera kind of moves around. This is really uh, an homage to the first film where they have these kind of moments on. Uh, let, me, let me get rid of the textures for now. So what needed to be done here is um, I needed to create a fairly accurate representation of the subway station and all the assets that go with it. But that's just one part of the equation, right? The big deal was how are we going to animate these characters fighting? And when it comes to time and money, I always go back to having, uh, you know, some Mixamo animations, some mocap animations in the back pocket. And that's how it's done. So we blocked out the fights with these poses and then, um, you know, used, I think we used probably Maxon assets as well from a motion capture library, but we wanted to kind of um, have this flow of them happening after one another. And that's why you saw all those pivot points. That's uh, a mocap sequence and that's another mocap sequence when it, when it starts. Um, it, this kind of indicates how these basic movements were laid out. Um, and what I like to do in a case like this is I convert them into uh, motion clips. Let me show you how that looks in case you want to know. Where is it? From the camera. Very cunningly, I, I call this Peter, right? Let's go to Keanu. So this is Keanu, this is uh, Keanu motion clips. So as you can see here on the left, these are all the movements that we identified that we needed for this sequence. Uh, and then you, then you bring it on here. Let me get rid of the joints, please. So when you bring it on here, uh, that's the fun bit where you can start kind of tweaking the timings, bringing in different motions, making sure that's why I have to move the pivot points that this next movement lines up. And that's a really fun and, 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 and cool way of creating an animation that looks much more difficult than it should be. How much time we have? Exactly a couple of minutes. That's brilliant. So let's move on for the last little thing. just in case you wanted to see how this entire sequence looked like. Hopefully it's gonna start one day. <laughs> oh, no, oh, oh. So 
It's brutal, I would say. It's not fair. <laughs> but look at this. That's my moment to shine. I really, I really enjoy this moment when there's nothing happening and then they're doing the usual. Um, this is exactly what I showed you earlier. So that was fun. We did a couple of variations, uh, timing-wise and camera-wise and camera placement-wise, and then we delivered it and they used it on set. So it's all good. Very quickly, I wanted to show you this. Uh, some other little animations that I had to do. We got a very basic model from production. I had to rig those little arms and they all kind of uh, tied to a, a null that has a vibrate tag on it and it just moves around and it creates this, this movement. No keyframes, rendered 15 version of it. Something like that. Uh, this was an interesting bit. This is all the head plug jack. This was meant to be fairly realistic. So I had to use hair and, and all sorts of other things. Let me just very quickly show you how it was set up in cinema. So it was quickly modeled taken into Substance Painter, painted some interesting metal textures, and then I had all sorts of variations on the hair, which I'm gonna turn on, because we did not know that he's gonna have short hair at this part of the film. We thought that he's gonna have, a, he's, he's gonna have longer hair, so we created all these versions with longer hair. But then, it's not really ideal, is it? <laughs> That's not a good look. But you can get away with it because the camera only shows you this. So, again, using Redshift and Cinema 4D, uh, a very quick process, rendering lots of variations, lots of different types of hair, because I think at one point they discussed other crew members being hooked up to this. So that was an interesting little thing uh, to do. You can see how it was textured. Just wanted to kind of give you a better overview of this. Uh, but then the important question, and that's the thing that I'm gonna finish my presentation with. So can I honestly say that I fought Neo in the Matrix? And the answer is yes. It's all in here. It's really difficult to, to see. Let me, let me show you this. Concentrate on that one. That's, that's the glory. That's that's what we are aiming for. This is this is a pinnacle of of achievement. You put all this hard work in there, and then it ends up in the film being like this. I really had to watch it a couple of times just to kind of get an idea of oh, whether that's in there. But we can we can get a closer look. I think it's very very representative and. Um, and yeah, I had lots of other stuff uh, which I can talk to you about. I'm gonna be here. Uh, but yeah, I just wanted to give you a quick overview how this process was uh, kind of utilized throughout the production and um, how my love for Cinema 4D and all the Maxim products are converted into hopefully something that's interesting. So thank you very much for being me with here. Um, I hope you found some interesting stuff here. Um, Thanks a lot. See you around. Thank you.